Right. Mic test. Okay. All right. Um, just a, a small report on what happens uh, today. Straits Times actually have a report about this Connect at Singapore. You know, this program was actually pushed up by PAP government, which has the idea to make Singapore as a place where businessmen from all over the world will travel to Singapore, stay at Changi Airport hotels, and start to talk. Right? They will not come into the community, and they will fly back. Right? And that that was a bubble, so called a bubble concept. So they were boasting about it before they push up. But I actually laughed at the idea. I said, why would anyone want to pay a hefty amount of money to fly to a place, come here just to talk and fly back? They have Zoom, they have Skype, they have almost everything. You know? Even WhatsApp. WhatsApp, you can do a communication. You know? It doesn't make sense, right? So Straits Times have um, done a report. Apparently, it seems that in May, only a, a, a couple of months after they launched the thing, they actually stopped the thing, uh, stopped the project because they gave a reason, oh, because of the heightened alert, whatever. Now heightened alert is off. They are not resuming it until further notice, right? So it gives some statistics. Uh, we, we are going to talk about statistics today, right? Yeah, okay, the statistics is they have only 120 bookings since the launch of this project. <laughs> 120 bookings only. Right? And apparently, it doesn't actually work. Right? It doesn't actually work. This is why they are going to suspend it. Most probably, just forget it. Uh, forget about it. After all the trouble they took in the logistic arrangement and all that. Okay? <coughs> now, PAP is always good in administration. But lack in hindsight. Or lack in foresight, I would say. Uh, it's unlike the old PAP in the past. But we have Go King Sui, we have Lim Kin San, who have very far foresight amongst their contemporary peers, right? They can look things into 10, 20 years. But now, if you are telling people this 4G, 3G leaders to actually plan for the next five years, I think they are blur. I do not know why, but they always claim that they always claim that um, oh, 100 years down the road, but you can't even take care of the next three years. Don't talk about 100 years down the road. No, I'm not convinced. Right? You can't even do a Good statistics presentation, but all skewed, all confirmation bias, or what we call what I call a concomitation bias. Concom, let me stupid that. Concomitation bias, and worse, intellectual dishonesty. I'm going to go into this. This is very very serious. Huh? If I I get it wrong, I can be sued, okay, or at least be pofma, right? Now, if you if you would be border. I put up some of the data, some of the, of the issues uh, before I come into this program. Okay, this one. Remember, this is the propaganda brochures put up by MOH in his website and his Facebook. Right? The title says, Should I vaccinate my child? A summary for parents based on data available on 30 June 2021. Uh, he claims it's data based. Unvaccinated and vaccinated. Okay. Let's look at the lighter one, the vaccinated. It claims that the Pfizer vaccine has 90% efficacy. Oh, no more 95%. Now it's, now it's 90%. Against COVID-19 and is suitable for children aged 12 years and above. Based on what? You have two sources. Right? I do not know what two sources it is. I didn't bother because the first statement is already wrong. According to what the data shows for the past few months, right? the efficacy of Pfizer vaccine is actually near to zero. In prevention, in prevention of infection and transmission, okay, very important. In prevention of um, transmission and infection, almost zero. Because whether you are in Changi Ho Hospital or Changi Airport or Tan Tong Seng Hospital, those people are actually those people are actually vaccinated, but they still cannot. Right? Then they push it to the Delta variant, the from India. Okay, but that's no excuse. Why should? I risk my life for a vaccine that is not effective. Who stop? But of course, the public narrative has changed. It changed to, oh, effective in keeping down serious illness from in infection. But I have actually explained right, the concept of screening. The vaccine itself is a mechanism of screening. If your immune system is weak or overreact to the virus itself, when you get injected, you also get re re uh, overreaction or get sick. Right? That's why there's so many adverse events. Right? And some people are dead after taking the vaccine. 
they can try to rationalize it. It's not linked to the vaccine, but no, this is not the way we do it. It's very simple. You, very simple. If a person kind of the infection of COVID-19 and he died, do we say that, oh, this death is not related to the COVID-19 because it's under the normal what um, incident rate of death in Singapore? You don't say that because the variable, the important variable to that person is the infection of the COVID-19 virus. Right? That is the most important significant factor of risk. Similar for vaccine. You don't use that excuse. But we can start to see, you see, uh, the scientific world have not used that excuse for a long time. Until now. <laughs> I do not know why. Right? If this excuse is valid, all the drugs who have passed, you know, in the past, all those dangerous drugs and vaccines who have passed the approval stage, but they have not used that. What, what background uh, incident? No, nobody used that in the past. Right? It's only in recent time because they want to justify mRNA vaccines. They use that excuse. It's a very weak excuse and it's not scientific. It's only a proposition, a hypothesis, which is not tested. And you cannot say it is a fact. Right? It is not the truth. Right? That aside. Now, it comes to Pfizer and, is, and it says that it is suitable for children age 12 and above. Based on what? I have actually shown you on my web page, there's one, one link, right? On the data, a study done by, okay, a study done by this PIC, Physician for Informed Consent. I will show you the, the, the thing. Huh? No. It's very important because this one is an analysis of the data provided by Pfizer itself on the trial on the children. Okay, And the conclusion is actually shocking. Show me you, show you this. The conclusion is actually shocking. It's right next after my last uh, thing. It's called this. Right. Okay. Now, at point seven, point seven of these two page, uh, three pages brochures. It's very detailed. It cites all the studies and it's, it put out a very informed opinion of what it is exactly very objective, right? It's very objective. It's not down there to say that uh, to run down the vaccine, but you see that according to this study, this is fighting, right? For subjects 16 years or older, the Pfizer vaccine found the overall incidence of severe adverse event during the two months observation. They have a two months trial to be 1.1 percent or one in 91, right? In the vaccinated group, and 0.6 percent in the unvaccinated group. Severe event means that. Headache la, fever la, no, all that severe event. So consequently, when you take the vaccine, it is higher incident. But this is very minor, all right? Only a 0.5% or 0.6% increase, okay? That is okay, right? Severe adverse event include fever, vomiting, no, requires hydration, diarrhea, blah, 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 okay? No. But the problem lies here. <coughs> when you cut the group, when you split the group into two, for 12 years old to 15 years old of age, then the Pfizer vaccine, for the overall incidence of severe event is 10.7%, one in nine in the vaccinated group, and only 1.9% in the unvaccinated group. Right? It is clear that the vaccine has a higher risk of creating a lot of discomfort or even life threatening situation. Right? To so the children, 12 to 15, one in 10. That is the risk your children will actually face. If he or she falls within this age group and take the vaccine. Okay. This is from Pfizer. This is not from anyone. Not from those um, those uh, conspiracy theories. From Pfizer itself. This is pure raw data analysis. Okay. Now, approximately 3,004 or 8% of the subjects 16 years or older right, sus experience sus suspected COVID-19 because they have symptoms. Start to have symptoms. Cola, whatever it is. Right. But we're not confirmed by testing. Not confirmed. They have symptoms only because they are not hospitalized, okay? Two of these cases require hospitalization, two only. Both of which were in the vaccinated group, both hospitalized with symptoms, not the unvaccinated one, no. So which is more risky, okay? Never mind. These cases could represent other influential illness, maybe flu and all that, right? 4079 such cases occur in the vaccinated group within seven days of injection where only 287 87 cases occur in unvaccinated group. It is almost what? 
um, almost 80% more. The vaccinated group is over 80% more than the unvaccinated group. Right? To have such symptoms. Right? Only cases that were reported as serious were recorded as adverse event. All right? So this is another category. With symptoms, they calculate. Oh, vaccinated group have more symptoms. Right? Then put into adverse event, serious one is still more. Naturally, la, because you have more, more vaccinated group uh, uh, children have more symptoms. Right? right? In the clinical trial, only 5% of all units suspected of COVID-19 were actually found to be COVID-19. 5% tested to be COVID-19. Okay. These are the raw data. No opinion put. You, you can see uh, they're very professional. They didn't put their opinion or even conclusion. They just show you the data. These are the breakdown. If they are wrong, they will be POFMA, they will be censored, they will be sued by Pfizer. But this is not. I believe this data was actually given, given to the PAP government. Why didn't the expert committee, expert panel, cite this data? Instead, go and cite other people's data, other people's studies, which is actually flawed. I'm going to, I'm going to show you how flawed it is later. All right? All right. Now, if you, you have time, go through it. It's very interesting. Very interesting. The conclusion, the only conclusion it comes in at the end. Right? There are some other things. I'm not going to run through it because it's quite detailed. Right? Moreover, per the FDA, there are currently insufficient data to make conclusions. FDA say what? Huh? To make conclusions about the safety of the vaccine in subpopulations such as the pregnant right? and other in, uh, latiting individuals. Okay? These are the conclusions insufficient data. I'm going to go through the pregnant woman later for a pregnancy one. It is really insufficient data and then it is actually incorrect and irresponsible to claim that it is safe for the pregnant woman in that sense. Okay, Very serious accusation of a academic level because you are saying something that you do not know to be true or without any data to back you up. And of course, one of the conclusion is, furthermore, since only about 1,100 vaccinated children aged 12 to 15 years of age were observed, there were not enough children included in the trial to be able to prove the vaccine is safer than the disease in children 12 to 15 years old. Okay, this is the conclusion. And why could we have MOH come with another conclusion that claim that the vaccine is safe? Bro. This is the serious doubts and questions I am putting up to MOH. It cannot be, you know, right? Down here it says, it's suitable for children age 12, and, 12 years and above. And it claims to be safe. But this says there's no data, enough data to show that. This is from the Pfizer data trial itself. Because why? Among the adverse events, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, there are no death, no death involved, right? No, not, no death involved that you cannot make comparison because the data itself is not large enough, right? That is why they cannot make that conclusion, right? And among this group of observations, very, only 5%, right? Only 5% of those with these symptoms are confirmed infected with the virus, which have no adverse illness. So how they can how can they make the conclusion? There's no data means that there's, there's no data. Correct. Right. Then it says as of April 12, 2021, the chance of a subject 0 to 17 years of age contracting SARS, that means the COVID-19, huh, and dying from COVID-19 is one in 290,000. One in 290,000. That do not know how many zeros percent. Zero point zero zero percent. And that is a risk. So as I said, if you want to prevent the death of the children from COVID-19 infection, which is well, not even 0.5%, it's 0.4%, right? And you subject your child to 10% of risk of adverse event. Yeah, are they crazy or not? What's their agenda? Ask MOH. I'm putting a serious challenge, yeah? There's no hearsay. And the second part of this, right? 
is even more laughable. It says that there's currently no Delta variant outbreak in our schools. MOH and MOE will continue to implement safe management measures. Can this be the plus to ask people to actually inject? If there's no outbreak of this variant, why should all the more, why should my children take the risk? Right? That should be a, that should be actually the reason why people should not risk their children in taking the check. But they I do not know how this expert committee or panel or the or the MOH doctors, uh, all the expert in that, right? Even the minister thing, you know. If there's no risk, infection risk is zero, zero. Now, now it's zero. You ask my children to go and take the risk of 10%. 10% known adverse event and unknown long-term impact. This, this data only provide the short-term impact, immediate adverse event. It doesn't provide the long-term impact on vaccine. We must always remember that. Okay? Bro, this is how they do things in MOH. That's why I cannot sleep, you know. Last night I cannot sleep. Until 2-3 o'clock I cannot sleep. I look at what? What are they trying to say? Okay. Now, it says that getting myocarditis, the heart information, right? It's extremely rare. Correct, but it happened in the vaccination. Right? For the small number who experience it, most of the cases were mild. This is wrong. I have to correct that. This is a misinformation. Now, why is this wrong? This is a bit technical. Huh? I, I actually learned about this just recently. A doctor actually explained it to me very, very detailed. He says that some organs can regenerate themselves, repair themselves. For example, the liver. Right? The liver can actually regenerate itself when it's hurt. Right? But for the heart, the important, everyone knows that without the heart, huh, you die. If it's malfunction, you die immediately. If there's a cancer in other organs, you still can cut, you know, replace, and but heart is very difficult. Now, when you have an inflation of the heart, whether it's the wall of the heart or the of the vessel and all that, blood vessel and all that, the damage is actually permanent. Because the heart itself, the muscles cannot regenerate itself. It means that even when you recover from the inflammation, parts of your muscles actually is damaged or destroyed the cells. So in the long term, you will still face a certain risk of heart problems. For example, heart problems means irregular heartbeats, right? Or malfunction, right? So it is not a not a very although it's rare, but it's not a a, a situation that can, you can just brush it aside. Huh? So this is a mis misinformation by MOH. No matter how mild the inflammation inflammation is on the heart, whatever damage is done is permanent. There's no replacement. There's no regeneration of the of the heart tissue. The heart muscle tissue. So you, everyone, have to help me to spread this message. This, share these videos if you find that I have talk sense. Why? Because PAP and uh, Facebook try to actually curb my outreach. Right? Just this morning when I wake up, oh, I, I kind of what fact check again. But the fact check is wrong. I didn't post that that video. It was an article from Israel Times. Huh? Israel Times. We reported certain uh, professional that talks about the overwhelming. Adverse event in port in US. And they claim that, oh, if you continue to do that, yeah, we will curb your outreach. I said, what? There's not connection. Although the, he's talking about the same person, but in this report, he doesn't talk about the death from vaccination. But the fact is, he's talking about the death of uh, vaccination. I said, what? How can Facebook doing this? They are very, they're trying to curb my outreach. And it can be seen from my 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 web, uh, my page, Facebook page. Right? It's okay. I will continue to talk. As long as I'm alive, right? So help me to spread the spread this important message. Huh? I'm going to go through this again. Okay. Okay. Now, now I come to the unvaccinated one. He said, basically, he says that if you are unvaccinated, what will happen to you? Wow, very alarming, huh? Wow, the the figures big, big one. In an international study, international studies are more. Twenty two point nine percent of child cases were placed in the ICU. Wow, 22% of 22.9% of child cases. And actually it give um, the um, reference. So I go and click, I go and find the reference of these, these studies. These studies is exactly the studies pointed out by David Lai. I'll show you why it's flawed. Right? What is this study about? Now, this study, the setting is done, is using the data. No, not, not the data. 
is done by searching all the research reports that comes up between the 1st of December 2019 to 8th of January 2021. That is even before the Delta variant or the from India that is spreading, right? So <coughs> that's irrelevant, number one, right? Now we are facing the threat is more on Delta variant. 3,350 articles were identified, right? But they screen it. They didn't take all the articles. They screen it, right? And 129 articles, studies were only included. Only one to nine. What are the screening criteria? When you do screening, bias, uh, concomitant bias will actually set in. Let me mind, it's okay, right? We are okay. So it says that confirm child uh, from age zero to 19 years old. Hey, bro, we're talking about 12 to, to 18 years old people in Singapore. This is from zero to 19. Number two, irrelevance. And the mean age of this group of data, of population, of uh, sampling, we call it. It's actually seven years old. Hey, we are talking about vaccination of our children from 12 to 18. You give me a study which is based on zero to 19 and with a mean, mean age of seven. Is that relevant at all? Right? Never mind. I would say there's second irrelevance. You see, uh, our, our expert can actually um, put up anything just to justify their case. Uh, anyhow, right? And this study is primary. This, this study is done to compare, to compare the results between children in more developed countries as to to less developed countries because there are factors differences. So remember, these studies is not done under the con the same condition. It actually segregate the condition. Those from more advanced country and less advanced country because their hospitalization facilities are different. So it might affect the death rate. It might affect the treatment, right? ICU avail uh, availability for all these children. These are all adult in this. No context given. They just give you 22.9%. Wow, very high. But I'm, I'm going to tell you how the statistics have been inflated. And that's intellectually dishonest. Okay. Even if we take this study at face, level, face, uh, face value. Okay, it says that among these 129 studies are a compilation from the 31 countries comprising 10,251 children okay we stop here first very simple calculation 10,251 children over 129 studies what are the sample the average sample size for each studies anyone anyone a quick calculation all right a quick calculation Less than 80 cases for each studies. Each studies for a sample size, sampling size of 80 cases only. That is not significant. Right. <laughs> okay. Right? That is not significant. Because you you cannot lump any, everything together and talk one, you know. When we do statistical studies, uh, within one study, we are assuming that all the factors, for example, you are talking about doing a study in Singapore, all the factors are affecting the same. But that is a variable of infection. But when you lump different countries together, all the factors are different between the countries, then there's a substantial statistical bias or differences between the thing. The error, the standard error will, will, will be very big. I don't I, I, I don't think this expert in MOH understand what is standard errors of combining all these studies. Huh? They just suka suka, okay, we combine and we take a look. How can you do that? <laughs> Never mind. Now, if it's out of 31 countries, that means each country is how many? On average, only 331 cases. Right? Over what period, there's no say. Although it says that the, these studies are, are actually searched among the two months, but different study will have a different duration, time frame of sampling, of data collection. So that actually itself is actually a standard error, right? In incoherence in the collection data, the sampling data. In statistical studies, sampling is everything. It must be a it must be a random sampling. Put it that way, random sampling. And it must be done in a very strict way. All sampling must be done together within a time frame. Also, some is two months earlier, some is two months later, 
Then what? Your sampling areas are great because two months can change, situation can change. Different countries face different situation. That's worse. We take it at face value, never mind. Right? What I'm trying to say, this study actually is unreliable because the standard errors is too high for statistical value. But the expert panel actually chose to believe it, right? Chose to use cite this cite these studies. Never mind. Okay. Okay. We do not even know how they do their sampling. Now. So it says that okay, fifty seven point four percent were hospitalized among the ten thousand two hundred fifty one. Wow, huge right, huge right. But wait, these samplings, these samples, or these children, how do they identify them? Okay. Actually, it didn't say, but there is actually um, uh, implied things in it because it says that mean age was seven years old. Standard deviation is 3.6. Let me mind about standard deviation. And 27.1% have multiple symptoms. So these children are actually identified when they have symptoms after the infection. Remember, infection of the virus, COVID-19, can be asymptomatic. That means you can do, don't have symptoms at all. And for the children, almost 90% don't have symptoms. So this is actually 10% of the whole infection group. Okay? <coughs> this is a rough estimate. Because by world data, statistically, almost 90% of children who are infected do not have any symptoms. Right? So they are actually taking one little part of the infected children to do a study. And they say, oh, half of it or 60% or 57.4% of it were hospitalized because of adverse event. Okay? So don't get very excited or very worried when you see these 57% were hospitalized. It's among those who have symptoms, not of the total population, total number of children who are infected by the COVID-19. Right? Those who are hospitalized is actually 2% or 2 2% or 1% only. Okay? So this is misleading. This data is misleading. The conclusion is misleading also, right? If actually strike fear in people, right? Never mind. Mean age was this. Fever, cough, blah, blah, blah. And then it go into a subgroup. I do not know why it go into a subgroup. 3,670 cases of, of this, 44.1% has radiographic abnormalities. That means spy problem. Never mind. The majority of cases recovered, 88.9% recovered. 96, 96 hospitalized children died. Right? 96 hospitalized children died. You put, even we are talking about all those with symptoms, uh, not, not inclusive of those who are infected without symptoms. 96 over 10,251, what is the percentage? 0 0.96. How about that? 0 0.9 plus percent. That's less than 1%. Right? Remember just now, just now the data I gave you from the uh, physician for informed consent, it says it's one out of 2,900, 290,000, the death rate. So even among, that is actually correct because this actually ex this excluded those who are infected without any symptoms. Even with symptoms, only 1% will die among these children. And you are telling me, wow, this is very, very uh, serious uh, and all that. MOH, the Ministry of Health of Singapore, is peddling fear in Singapore to parents, right? To manipulate their perception, to misinform them, misleading them into fearful stances so that they will push their children for vaccination. That is the only conclusion I have. Because this is exactly from the data given by them. But why did they come up with 22.9% and what, 3.6% death? I'll tell you why. That is even intellectually dishonest. Okay. Then blah, blah, blah. And uh, they were comparing. Then down, they were comparing between the low-income and the middle-income countries. All right? Right? For ICU rate. Right? For the higher-income countries, the ICU rate is 9.9%. 9.9%. Okay? For the low-income rate, is 26%. Okay? That is the difference. The purpose of this study is to make comparison between low and high income. That means the developed countries and the uh, less developed countries. The differences. Right? Okay? So, children with severe disease receive certain treatment more frequently than those who are non-severe disease. Good. Then it comes to this important part. Subgroup analysis. Subgroup means that 
within these 10,000 over cases, they go, they go and select a subgroup. Do not, I do not know what criteria they use, but they, they just crop it out the subgroup analysis. This is where MOH decided to cite the figures. It's just a small group, a subgroup of a small, of a small group of studies, right? Then it says that, oh, admitted to ICU is 40, 41%, right? Versus 22.9%, right? It means that those who are multi, multi-system inflammatory system, those with multi inflammatory problems within the, uh, within the children have a higher incidence of going to ICU. That's, that's really okay. That's understandable because you are, you've got heart inflammatory, you've got uh, lung inflammatory, of course, you have a higher chance of going to ICU. Right, versus 22.9%. Okay. That is the 22.9% you are talking about. We have no context what the subgroup size is. We have no context why this subgroup is selected, how the sam uh, uh, sampling was done, and what are the standard er errors. But they select these big, big numbers. Right? Instead of 9.9%, right? Middle income, we are considered a, a middle and higher income group countries. Our ICU rate is actually 9.9% out of, out of what? Out of those with symptoms. That is a fact. It's actually less than 1% out of the whole population. As I said, those with symptoms is actually very few, 10% only. Right? Hospitalized even fewer. In ICU is even fewer, less. Death rate is, what, 0 0.000, don't know how many zeros. Right? Percent. And they try to manipulate people's perception using that 22.9%. Okay. And then it said higher proportion of hospitalized children with multiple information in the body uh, died. 4.8% versus 3.6%. So they use a 3.6%. That is 3.6% without multiple issues with, with uh, information in the body. But this is subgroup. We don't even know the context. That is totally misleading. If you want to use these studies, you can use 96 died, okay, out of 10,251. That's 0.9%. And these 10,251 are those with symptoms, which did not include those who are infected without symptoms. That is a proper context. Why do you use 3.6%? To strike fear in people. Intellectually dishonest. Confirm. I don't believe those intelligent experts in there do not know how to read. To know how, know how to do simple calculation. They choose to use misleading figures without context. I would say the intention is actually discredit the whole Ministry of Health in Singapore. Okay? No. Again, Whatever percentage we derive from these studies is not representative of the true risk for the age group in real world. Okay? It's a subset or a subset. Okay? And the MOH chose to use the largest percentage, regardless of the context, to frighten parents. Because they know that Singapore parents are very kiasu kiasi one. They look at, wow, I'm so big, they all run. Run to push their children for vaccination. Right? I have to take a break after going through it. You, now you know why I cannot sleep last night. When I go through this, wow, <laughs> what are they trying to do? Right? What are they trying to do? Now, the second part, the third claim, you know, Israel is now rushing to vaccinate children because of the Delta variant outbreak. Is it true? Actually, it's not. They actually took two months to deliberate the consequences. They wanted to do it in March. Uh, March. In, only in May. Then they decided to go. But later on, when they found that the heart information problems, they actually was hesitant. They was hesitant on it. Right? Okay. I do not know why we have this bunch of people in IMOH or supposedly highly paid, whether it's minister or those professional, want to scare people like that. 
they thought that nobody actually scrutinized all the data they provide. Right? Why didn't they use the Pfizer trial data? We actually show, we actually show there's no conclusion. It's not conclusive at all in comparison of the effectiveness and the safety of the vaccine. In fact, the Pfizer study actually shows that there will be more adverse events but because it's a controlled group, huh? this one is not controlled. Pfizer have two groups. One is unvaccinated. That is called a control group. To show that within this same period, in the same place, right? how many will derive fever, well, diarrhea, adverse event? Well, those vaccinated, how many will, will have such? And it is very clear when you take the vaccine, the risk is very much higher than those who do not take the vaccine of having such event, adverse event. That is actually a proper clinical trial. Although it's done by Pfizer, people will have doubt, doubts about it. But even if anyone wants to massage the data and all that, it still shows the same. In terms of safety, no, I don't think so. Although, no death yet because the data is actually small. Right? Very small. How can you come to the conclusion? Such conclusion that is safe and effective. Right? There's no higher incidence. In fact, uh, Remember, the, the two hospitalized children were actually vaccinated, not the unvaccinated, right? There's no incidence, life-threatening in the sense that people died, children died from COVID-19 during that trial, whether it's vaccinated or unvaccinated, because the death rate is so low, right? 0.004%. If you do not have a large enough data, you will not see it. Large means 100,000, 200,000, or a, a million data set. Okay, so because it's 1 in 290,000, uh, 290,000, so you must have at least 300,000, for example, data set that you, you see one death for those who are unvaccinated. Okay, theoretically speaking, la. so you, you do not have enough data to make your claim. So I'm very disappointed, very, very disappointed. I already said, when David Lai said that, I actually questioned his motive. That this study is irrelevant, totally irrelevant. The study was done not to find out whether the vaccine is safe or not, or whether the COVID-19 infection is jialat or not. Okay? It's not. It's done to compare two categories of countries, how the children suffered differently. Right? That's why it doesn't care about the whole population of infection. It only care about those with symptoms. Totally different context. Okay. Now we come to the pregnancy. Okay. Uh, the pregnancy database, right? Cited. Well, it comes from two sites. What they call the V-safe data, uh, mobile phone data. In America, it's like that. If you take the vaccine, you can download the apps, right? Just state when you take the vaccine, right? Then after how many days, anything happened to you, blah, blah, blah. So they track, they do a tracker, right? They have identified, right, within a certain period, right? 35,691 in the database. This is voluntary, uh. it's, it's not a complete database, uh. who are pregnant, pregnant women who took the vaccine, okay? And the sample size, it ultimately, when they approach these people who have registered their pregnant and they want to do a tracking, the sample size is only 3,958. Okay. Completed pregnancy is 827. Okay. Now, I want to talk about this. It is a com incomplete, incomplete uh, analysis because if you have sample size of 3,958, you want to study on this amount about 4,000 people. You must wait until everyone completed their pregnancy. Then you can do a more complete analysis. But only one third, as we say, when the study was written, only 827 have completed their pregnancy. When you talk about complete completion of pregnancy means what? You either have miscarriage or you give birth. Or when you give birth, the baby died. Or the baby died inside your womb and you gave birth. Okay? These are these are called completed pregnancy, whether it's miscarriage or not. Okay. Pregnancy loss is 115. Right? Out of 
827. So the percentage is 13.9%. When they try to do this, uh, they compare to the natural incident, the past historical data, they say within, within the 10 to 15% pregnancy loss. I do not know why they use a 10 to 15%. Because historical data, when you take average, 10% means 10%, 15% means 15%. Why would they want to put the range? Just to make sure that this is put in the so-called the normalcy. Right? Okay. Now the problem is this. Not every pregnant woman in this data set took their vaccine at the same period, same time of pregnancy. For example, okay? for example, huh? only 28.6% took the jab when they are in the first trimester. That means less than 14 weeks of pregnancy. They took the jab. Right? 2.3% actually took the jab before they know they before they know they are pregnant during the period that they do not have menses and then they found out they're they're pregnant 30 days later okay so the data said if we want to do a study a proper study of the effect of the vaccine on pregnancy we will do what we'll study people who are taking the vaccine in their first trimester the best is within the first few weeks so that we can study that what is a long-term effect, a short-term effect within this pregnancy period? And after they give birth, whether the baby survive, and whether the baby will have a, a higher mortality rate later on. This is a proper one. But in this study, different percentage comes in from people are taking the vaccine in different stages of pregnancy. Right? Most people took at the second trimester, 43.3% took the jab between 14 to 28 weeks. So remember, only 1,132 took in the first uh, trimester. Majority took at the second trimester. And 25.7% 5, took in the third trimester. Okay. Now, when the study is done, only one third completed their pregnancy. So what it means? Those in the third trimester, not all have completed their pregnancy. Even that. So how can you conclude the, the whole study is relevant to compare to the historical data? It's not. You cannot compare like that. Because it's partial. Right? There's no breakdown, actually. We, you still cannot see the breakdown. This is very statistical. Right? You cannot take a partial results of a for a study to compare to the overall historical data and claim that it is normalcy. You cannot. You must complete the whole trial before you can do the proper comparison. And we are not actually looking at the at the same injection period. So there's no way of doing a proper study like that to infer anything at all. If you want to do a study all right, of safety, when to take, when it is safe for a pregnant woman to take the jab, you can break them up. Those who are first trimester, second trimester and third trimester. Three groups of studies. It should be done that way. It's the same thing that what I've discussed just now. But you cannot combine data like that. Because the variables and factors are totally different. In this case, it's different. Because at different stage of pregnancy, the formation of a fortis is different. It might have different impact on the fortis at different stages of pregnancy. So this study cannot, cannot make any sense. Right? It should be break into three studies. But they, they have not done that. I do not know why. Okay. That is why I say when you do, when you read such data, this analysis of data, you must be very careful. This definitely a confirmation bias study. Definitely. Right? The reason being that they are trying to use an incomplete study with, with doubtful sampling. Doubtful sampling means that the injection period is totally different. Okay, totally different. How can you conclude the impact of the vaccine as one whole? And pregnancy is very sensitive to timeline. First trimester, second trimester, the risk is higher at first trimester. And it's shown that right, 96 out of 100 and zeros and four spontaneous abortion, which is miscarriage, happened in the first trimester before 13 weeks. Right? It is true. So if I look at this, my only conclusion can be very simple, but not complete. Huh? 
it is more dangerous to take the vaccine when you are in your first trimester. Okay? Because other than that, right, most of the babies are developed born. Right? Only with one death, I think. And normalities is 16. And, norm and normalities means that the baby's got some problems here and there. Right? Small size. Maybe that small size is 23. Right? But other than that, this actually within the normal norm, historically speaking. But the sample size is too small. 800 only. If you are strictly speaking, the sample size is actually 827, not 3006, uh, 2009. Okay? It's too small. Therefore, therefore, the conclusion for this study, it says that there is not enough data. There is not enough data to infer anything, to conclude anything. It is just a pre preliminary data set to show people. Okay? It's not enough data. Then I ask the same question to MOH again. If there's not enough data to conclude, because if you take into three different categories, each category is only 1,000 plus of sample size. You cannot derive inferment of safety or efficacy issue. How could we ask our pregnant woman when take the jab? That is the same conclusion. You are throwing us with data which is incomplete. Incomplete, that's number one. Insufficient, that's number two. Right? And number three, sampling problem. Right? Sampling problem. There's not doesn't even make sense. In this case, the study should be break into three, not colluded as one. So please, these are my findings. Right? These are my findings. They are anyhowing the conclusion is very, very simple. They are anyhow throwing smoke screen, right? Grapplings at straw. Whatever data, whatever studies that can justify their, their decision that they will throw at you without giving you the context, without even looking whether it's relevant or not. People study between uh, a, a contrast study between two different groups of countries, they throw at you and say that is the that is the result. My goodness. And we have this bunch of people in our expert panel. We should worry. As I have said, first time they make mistakes about the masking, okay lah, we say, maybe it's an oversight, whatever. But this second time, when I look at the way they, they choose the data, they choose the day, choose to propagate the studies that is doubtful, this is no longer an innocent, no longer, seriously, that's, this is not, no, this is no longer an innocent mistake. It's a deliberate attempt of misinformation to the public and it is in public interest public health interest to call them out okay okay any question i didn't i i didn't know that i have to do this you know public education on on um on st statistics, statistical study right Okay, David Chua. I've come, have came across cases from UK that four pilots from British Airways have died and we reported them in the media. Okay. I, I, I must be very careful, uh, David, because I'm being under the radar. They will jump at me at every instance. Every little mistakes or pursue, as I said in the, in the beginning, even a post that didn't include the misinformation, they want to fact check me and use that as a reason to actually curb my outreach. So I nowadays I'm very very careful in my sharing, right? So in this case of about these pilots, uh, I can only say I have no data, I have no no privileged details about it. I cannot look into it. What happens? Even a timeline, right? I prefer not to make any comment, right? But of course, to have one pilot die a day maybe is coincidence. To have four pilot die within a short period of time. It might not be a coincidence. There must be some factors affecting them. That's a fair, fair comment. It might be what well, working environment hazard. Many other factors other than the COVID nineteen injection. Of course, COVID nineteen injection is one of the major difference change in factor of risk. That's a fair statement. Uh, yeah, 
I have you see my technical knowledge in, in this, uh, okay, Desmond actually said if you speak with data charge, it will not be so boring. Yeah or no. But I can only use a live like that. I, I can I cannot use Zoom because Zoom will be very cumbersome for me. I'm sorry for that. All right. Okay, that's all for today. All right. So I hope people will share this of how ridiculous this this video uh, of how rig ridiculous MOH is acting. It seems it, it seems that it doesn't matter who is a minister of health, right? Because this platform has been so called hijacked by a mRNA vaccine agenda. Their purpose is to throw smoke, to even asking people to take unnecessary risks. It's very clear that those from the young children, whether it's twelve to eighteen or zero to eighteen have very little risk even if they have COVID-19 infection, even if they are unvaccinated and have COVID-19 infection. But people start to do manipulation of data comparison to show irrelevant studies to justify their decision, their agenda. And this is dangerous. Instead of using the official Pfizer data by Pfizer themselves, the product manufacturer themselves, they use dupious studies which is totally irre irrelevant for our decision making. Right? And you have to ask, what will become of Singapore if we are so foolishly being blindsided by this misinformation? I call it misinformation. I cannot profma, profma them. Okay? I cannot profma them. Only the Minister of Health can profma me. Because I do not have the power. But the only way that Singaporeans can actually say no to this government is to go to your MPS, your MP, and question them. Right? Question them in detail. Why are they doing this? Why are they scaring people with all these big numbers when these big numbers are actually forced in context? Right? So I hope you will do our part. If you like this video, share it. Okay, subscribe to my page by like liking this or follow this uh, page. And I said, I'm under the radar. They will censor me. They will cut my outreach, but help to fight this Facebook tyranny. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.